Port hangs on by a couple of inches. The Doggies get their season back on track and the Saints make it four in a row. This is The Round So Far, brought to you by Amy. Hello and welcome to The Round So Far, brought to you by Amy. I'm Riley Beveridge. This is Kane Corns. Kane, it's been such a dramatic weekend of football so far. We'll start tonight with our big story at the SCG, where Port Adelaide held on by the skin of its teeth. Unbelievable scene. So here's Ollie Florent with well, after the siren, and it looks like it's going through. The camera <laughs> angle that we have access to is ordinary. And for all money, that is a goal. Sydney thought it was a goal, but Alir Alir and Port Adelaide players were switched on on the line. It didn't go the journey and Port Adelaide hold on for a famous two-point victory. And it's going to be hard to find a game that is more dramatic than this one for the rest of the year. So they're now two and two on the season, Port Adelaide. Sydney also two and two. For all of the criticism this man, Ken Hinckley's copped over the last couple of weeks, two and two, season back on track. But Kane, I want to take you through the moment of the round so far. And that is this guy, this match-winning effort from Ollie Florent. The, the actual lead-up play was good. They drilled two kicks from the half-back flank. But then Alira Lee's the hero, isn't he? Yeah, well, he is. Port Adelaide actually won the clearance and sent it inside 50. But because they all had all their numbers back, Sydney mm. were able to work their way through. There's Ken Hinckley, who coached on the boundary line. And right on the siren, he has this shot. He had a very good game, Ollie Florent. It was a seesawing affair. And there's not a lot you can tell from that angle. We'll get a better look at it from a different angle as to how sharp Port Adelaide were on the line. They had everyone back there. Sydney, in hindsight, could have done some things differently. So there's a better angle of it. And it's fallen a couple of metres short. Mm. There's no doubt about that. Jonas Dixon and Ali is the one. Not sure what Callum Mills is doing. Celebrating there and not getting any body on the Port Adelaide players. Laddams would have been more aggressive if he had his time again. But just what this means in the context of Port Adelaide's season. Mm. They've now beaten Brisbane and Sydney, yeah. two very good sides. They've lost to Collingwood, who are also a very good side. Yeah. Adelaide are good as well. Uh, so their draw's been really difficult. They play mm. the Bulldogs next week. So to keep their season alive like that after the criticism that the club has been under this week was one of their you know, more famous moments um, so far this season. And they were 20 points down midway through the last quarter before they kicked four of the last five goals of the game. So we'll get a look at some moments here late in the match, but it was, it was really a fantastic win for them. They were 25 points down the second term. They got it back to level at halftime. And as I mentioned, 20 points down when, Oli, when uh, Isaac Heaney kicks this goal. They come back and win it. And they were inaccurate in the last quarter, so they kicked four straight behind to start the fourth quarter and then piled on four out of the last five goals to win. And if there's been a criticism over them, it's been when games in the balance and they're there to be won against good sides, and there's been some criticism that they haven't beaten enough top eight sides. There's McEntee kicking that one there. A good moment for a young player. I thought Dylan Williams across halfback was outstanding. There's a 50-metre penalty paid against mm. Charlie Dixon. I didn't think it was undisciplined. He just missed the kick. The umpire eventually paid a 50, and Blakey kicked that one to put Sydney back up in front. Dersma swings that around. A, a terrific mark from Jeremy Finlayson. Uh, his wife, Kelly, is facing some really significant health battles and he spoke emotionally after the game about what that meant to him. Mm. So, I mean, there was storylines everywhere yeah. and I guess a game like that is, is what we love about the footy. One of those storylines that you mentioned, a really unfortunate one, Paddy McCartan subbed off early in this game. We know about his long concussion history. He spent two years out of the game with concussions and was subbed out with a really nasty one here. Yeah, and there wasn't much contact, was there? I mean, just his face brushed the ground and um, you know, struggled to get to his feet, which we won't show there. There's the scenes there and with his mm. history and the time, as you said, that he spent out of the game. Uh, it's going to be, uh, you know, it's going to have to be treated really carefully this yeah. week from the club and the family. And there's his brother in a really yeah. significant clash with Todd Marshall. And he was also out of the game mm. with a head-related knock. So just a horrible night for the McCartans and their family. Yeah, really disappointing to see. We'll head to the MCG now where the Western Bulldogs made it two in a row. They got it back to two and two on the season with victory over Richmond. Another one with some really dramatic moments late game. Yeah, it was. I mean, this was seesawing as well. And... The Western Bulldogs in really difficult conditions, particularly in the second half when the rain came down. They were far too strong. Hannon kicks a really good goal there after the ball use from both sides, as you can imagine, in a high-pressure game in these conditions was poor. Uh, Norton got the better of what is now 
a relatively undersized Richmond defence mm. with, with Gibkiss and Tarrant out of the side. Norton kicked three on the night. And, and when the game was up for grabs, it was the Western Bulldogs that were better. In fact, the Western Bulldogs were the better side for three quarters mm. of this game. It was the second quarter where Richmond dominated. They kicked eight goals to two in the second quarter, including seven in a row. Um, but Luke Beveridge has won the last two. Yeah. Uh, like Port Adelaide, I guess, they've got their season back on track. And for Richmond, I guess it's a bit of a different story, a pretty average and ordinary start. Only one win in their first four games for the Tigers. You mentioned that Shea Bolton, that last goal came with 33 seconds left. But they did enough, the Dogs, they won a pretty pivotal centre clearance and then got the ball forward here to take home the points. But the centre clearance battle was interesting throughout the entire game. So the Dogs won the centre clearance is 43 to 25, so they were plus 18 in clearance. And Marcus Bontempelli was unbelievable throughout. He'd have to be the best clearance player. Oh, I couldn't believe the amount of space they've got. There's Taranto just waltzing through. Bontempelli clearly the best player on the ground last week against Brisbane and led from the front. It was an extraordinary captain's performance. And then about five minutes into the second quarter, he's had seven clearances. And mm. some of this work is as good as you are ever going to see. It's an absolute masterclass of how clean he is and how quickly he can dispose of the ball in and amongst traffic. So I reckon Charlie Curnow is the best player in the game. Marcus Bonzampelli for me is clearly second. And like I spoke about last week, mm. the lack of respect that some of these elite midfielders are getting in today's football is a thing that I, I dislike about the game. I yep. just think it shows a bit of arrogance. And there was arrogance there from the Richmond team to allow Bontempelli to have seven clearances in about 35 minutes of footy to start the game. Bit of a concern for Richmond with Tom Lynch, whether or not he's in MRO worry. For this hit what on Alex think? Keith. Well, Keith was subbed out with concussion. I've got concerns for Tom Lynch here because he turns his body and actually doesn't contest the mark. So he doesn't. He never once goes for the mark in this contest. Yep. So if you've got an alternative, so if you if you yeah. got to play on the ball yep. and you choose the alternative yep. and you go for the man and you bump, you get them high, yep. and then they're concussed, yeah. you're in trouble. Now, a year ago, I wouldn't have said that, mm. and I don't think there was anything malicious from Tom Lynch there in that marking contest. Yep. He's almost trying to protect himself. But, yeah, he he is in trouble, particularly because mm. Keith was subbed out and, and didn't play the, the remainder of the game. Well, in a strange way, if he puts his knee up and bodies him he with his knee, right. he would have been OK. It's the fact that he actually doesn't contest the ball and turns his body to brace. I want to ask you about Trent Cochin. He came on as the substitute in this one. He was left out. Now, Richmond said he was managed earlier in the week. Yep. Then he's named as an emergency and he's ultimately the medical sub. Now, he's brought on halfway through the second quarter when Jack Graham here limps off with a hamstring injury. I mean, what are their plans now with guys like Trent Cochin and Jack Rewell, who's another one who didn't play I today? actually liked it from Alistair Clarkson because if there's one criticism I've got about Richmond, it's probably they're under 23s and there's not a lot of them coming through. So I'd much rather see Sonzi play than mm. Cochin play a full game. Now, they will manage a champion like Trent Cochin to 300 games. I think it was two. 91 tonight, but yep. I had no issue. Damien Harwick put it on the agenda in pre-season. He said, mm. we'll use a bit of the Geelong model. They won't play every game. And, you know, as I said, they, they had some good young players. Judson Clark played mm. and, um, and and some others, So, including Sonzi, as I mentioned. Noah Cumberland Noah played Cumberland, a yep. full game, which is good to see, and he's lively. So no issue whatsoever. Cochin and Revolt will still play a major part in the remainder of the season, I assume. We'll head to Marvel Stadium now, where the Saints are 4-0 for the first time since 2010. Now, before the season came, we were saying their forward line was decimated. Max King's out with a shoulder. Tim Membry's got a knee injury. Jack Hayes has a foot problem. But they're finding goals from just unusual sources. So last week I said they sticky-taped the forward line together. It's exactly what they've done, but it's more than that. This is a this is a big story, St Kilda, mm. the way that they're playing their footy. They've made my pre-season predictions look foolish yeah. I, and I certainly didn't expect anything like this from St Kilda after what I saw in the pre-season and coupled with the injuries that they've got here's Higgins like yeah. he's four last week he's kicked five he's playing sharp he's defending really well he's unselfish when he's in positions to hand the ball off to teammates in better positions uh, Butler's playing great footy there's Filippo who just adds that elite talent and zest and mm. spark that's the defending Sinclair is already an Austra all Australian and He's playing better footy than yeah. what he played last year, if that is possible. So they've got probably a handful, maybe mm. 10 players in career best form. And just a shout out to Cal Wilkie. Yeah. He was extraordinary. I reckon it was a flawless defender's game tonight. Six or seven intercept marks and the amount of one-on-one -on -one contests he won against a good opponent in Ben King. It was outstanding. All Australian squad last year. We mentioned him last yeah. week. Uh, if he keeps this up, um, he's a lock. 
We'll get to our Saturday star now, Kane. And I reckon St Kilda's uncovered a genuine star in Machito Owens, part of their Next Generation Academy system. 27 disposals, 19 contested possessions, two goals and two goal assists. Oh, so where's, where's he come from? How, how did 32 other teams... He's an yeah. NGA product, of yeah. course, for, for the Saints. But what a bonus to get him that late in the draft. He's, he's a big boy, isn't he? Like 191 mm. centimetres. He'll eventually play in the midfield, but... Huge numbers, career best game, sitting on people's heads, kicking goals as he's done all year, winning contested footy, getting the ball in really dangerous positions, and he's smart. Like, he knows yeah. there, I'm going to play on because I've got a teammate over the back. So, terrific game sense, got a really nice nature about him, and this is freakish. Like, yeah. this sort of stuff is, is A-grade quality stuff for a player who's played 11 games. So, St Kilda said throughout the trade period, we need some more A-grade talent mm. onto our list. So, you got Filippo, you got Owens, you got Max King when he comes back, and all of a sudden, that's putting bums on seats for the Saints supporters. He's one of those prototype modern footballers now, 190 centimetres. Good overhead. Around that range, good overhead, good on ground level, can do it all. He's going to be a real player for that football club for the next decade, I reckon. Where are the Suns at? They were incredibly disappointing. They're now one and three on the season, got a difficult month ahead of them as no, well. No, it was more than disappointing. It was a pathetic performance, really. Like, for a quarter, they were good, mm. and they had their ball movement going, and they were their pressure was up, and they were defending well, and then it completely capitulated. Yeah. They couldn't handle uh, any of the Saints' pressure. Um, they, they froze their ability not to be able to neutralise, not even win contests in their forward 50, neutralise them. They, mm. they couldn't do it. And I mentioned Wilkie, but even Battle was taking yeah. intercept marks. So uncompetitive performance, I would call it, for, for Gold Coast. And they told us they were ready to play finals at the start of the year. Well, if you're ready, you've got to beat teams like St Kilda yeah. and Essendon when it's even at three-quarter mm. time. So it's almost season over already. And that was a pretty confronting performance for, for Stuart Jew. He's not going to like watching the tape back on that one. We head to the Adelaide Oval now where the Crows beat the Dockers. This was born out of their forward pressure and that small forwards fleet that they've got are really exciting. I thought it was the complete performance from Matthew Nix's side against a, a team that played finals last year. So that goal there from Taylor Walker, there's a bit of luck in that, no doubt, but it's born off forward 50 pressure and tackles. This is a Phil thought. Doesn't matter who mm. it is, doesn't matter who's down there, that is forward 50 pressure, turn the footy over. I think they kicked 12 goals from Fremantle turnovers and they were just at them. They dominated the ground ball battle, plus 25 in ground balls. They dominated loose balls, dominated possession. Um, and despite the inside 50 count being even, they were just so much more effective and efficient when they went in there. Once again, look, look at the pressure here. Fremantle got no method in which they were moving the footy, and that is all the credit to Matthew Nix's game plan. I'm telling you, the Adelaide Footy Club is a very good football team. We'll talk about Fremantle now, because they're now 1-3 and three on the year. But, Kane, they haven't played a side that made finals last year. So their whole first month, they've played no teams that made finals, and somehow they're still 1-3. and three. Their ball movement going inside 50 is just so slow and so dour at the moment. Remarkably, they're plus 29 for inside 50s on the season, and yet they've only won one game. Yeah, so, and last week they beat West Coast, mm. who may as well have had you out there, because there was no one fit to play. Yeah. Like, they had no one. They are injured, so that's their one win against West Coast, and this is what you've highlighted today. I mean, how easy is this to defend? This is, this is gold. You get your Ruckman back, you get your spare defender back, you know, it's long, it's wide, and you can just defend it so easily. That from Brayshaw back around, but there's no speed on the ball movement. Last week, I thought they may have turned a, a corner with their ball movement and their ability to go a bit faster. But since Matthew Pavlich, they have not had a forward. Mm. They've tried everyone. I mean, they've thrown the checkbook at a number of forwards from Cam McCarthy to Cloak to to Luke Jackson, but this, this is what you're getting in the forward mm. line. Tabana is just... He's a shadow of the player that he has been at his best, giving away free kicks today. Jackson's not a forward. He's a ruckman, so don't even bother with Jackson in the forward line. It's not going to work. Jai miss I like. Yeah. Um, first round draft pick, and he's going to be a very good player. And, and, and Josh Tracy's not up to, to the level. So same issues for Justin Longmuir, who has uh, hit a real challenge in his coaching career despite a really impressive start. Really interesting moment during this game with young Adelaide forward Jake Saligo when he kicked the goal and then makes contact with the goal umpire. Now, it's interesting. So you can either be referred directly to the tribunal if you make intentional contact with an umpire, but for that to happen, it's got to be deemed aggressive, forceful, demonstrative or mm. disrespectful. I'm not sure this is that. There is either unreasonable, unnecessary or careless contact with an umpire, which is fine. I think they'll probably deem this as being unreasonable. unreasonable. I think he's... 
he's almost surprised himself that he's kicked a goal there, it seems, and he's just tried to get the umpire's attention and say, hey, no, I kicked that. Yeah, hey, hey, you, I yeah. kicked it. It was a really stupid thing to do. Mm. Once again, there was no malice in it. I, I wonder what the conversation would be if it was a Toby Green type or a player yeah. with, a, with a record and a history like that. I can guarantee it would be a little bit different than... Saligo, who we're more than happy to give the benefit mm. of the doubt to. Um, so I think it's a please explain from the AFL. Yeah. Hey, don't touch the umpire. Mm. Here's a fine. Pay the fine and don't do it again. But I don't think he misses games for that. We head to the Gabba now on Thursday night where Brisbane inflicted the first defeat of the season for Collingwood and Kane. They finally listened to you. You've been saying this for weeks. Cam Rayner has to play forward. What were they thinking putting a man with this much talent to half back? Put anyone else to half back. You've got a game changing player that was likened to Dustin Martin when he was drafted at number one in the draft. He did his knee. Last year he came back, kicked a goal a game, including four at Marvel Stadium in round 20 against St Kilda and broke out. And the bright idea was to put him to half back. Mm. Ridiculous. So he was the one after Collingwood started really sharply and it looked to be you know, all one-way traffic for the Pies that really flicked the switch, took the hanger, kicked that goal and was the best player on the ground. Mm. So he should never, ever step foot in defensive 50 again. <laughs> and luckily, luckily it only took them three weeks yeah. to realise that they'd made a mistake and rectify it. He's a forward midfielder. He's mm. not a halfback flanker. Collingwood, when it works for them, it looks brilliant. When it doesn't work, we saw what we saw on Thursday night. Their first loss of the season. They play such attacking footy that this is the risk. This ball's in dispute here, and when they lose the contest, Brisbane have four or five players to kick to unopposed inside 50. It looks amazing when it works, as you said, and it looks horrible when it doesn't. So that was my, my query over Collingwood. Are they too easy to score against, mm. and do their defenders give you too much room? Now, we're going to see a number of examples where they just don't get back hard enough, and they just they almost blindly press and it would have been heaven as a Brisbane yeah. forward to play in this, provided you get the pressure up the ground and provided you're turning the footy over. Because if you don't, they'll cut you to ribbons. But more there. Like, what, he's in no man. Am I going to press? Uh, no, mm. uh, he's just in two minds. And then all of a sudden, you get the easy mark outside the back. I mean, Charlie Cameron kicked six on them. A, a small forward kicking six goals on a team that would fancy themselves as a defensive you know, strength of theirs, um, they were exposed and they were exposed badly. Let's mm. see if any other teams can follow what Brisbane did. We should have known that Brisbane would win because their record at the Gabba <laughs> since the start of 19 is incredible. 41 and 8 at the Gabba. On the road, though, they're just going just a little bit better than 50 50. That's why last year was impressive for them. They mm. won a couple of big games away from the Gabba um, at the MCG. But yeah, they're, they're chalk and cheese, a different yeah. team. And that's exactly what they've been this year. Lose round one, yeah. bounce back at home against a good side round two, yeah. lose round three and bounce back. So I'm still not convinced on exactly where their premiership credentials sit. All right, we'll head to our Amy Clangers now. Who covers Clangers? Amy does and Kane. Poor Harry Mackay, he had a really good game on Good Friday, but you can't miss from the top of the goal square you or from right on the goal line. You can't miss from the goal square, or can you? Because <laughs> we've gone back and it reminded us <laughs> of this come on, Lingy. That's very, very similar to Harry Mackay. And we've even gone back further. We've gone to the Icar Icarves, Icarves. Johnny's our magnificent producer who's <laughs> gone to the tape, and Josh Bruce even misses that. He has. There's a really bad one coming up with Malcolm Blight. He wouldn't want to see this one oh. again. This one's from... You've even pulled out Blighty. My old man's days. <laughs> but when he, he thinks he's run into an open goal but runs into the points. He thinks he got it. He's, he's celebrating. He thinks that was a goal, Blighty, about the only mistake he made <laughs> through his career. But Harry was terrific, yep. as was Charlie, which we're going to get to. We will get to that. But before we do that, Amy, Amy Clangers for Good is back for the 2023 season. Amy is donating $10 to Community Footy for every Every clanger recorded over selected rounds with eight lucky local clubs across the season taking home up to $15,000 each. To put your club in the running, head to afl.com.au forward slash clangers for good and tell us what the clanger donation would mean for your local club and footy community. Kane, as you mentioned, Marble Stadium, big game on Good Friday and the two key forwards, Harry Mackay and Charlie Kerno, lit it up for the Blues. Now, this was a north side, bearing in mind, that didn't have yep. Ben Mackay and Griffin Logue was out suspended. Yeah, so we shouldn't be surprised by this under the roof with a north Melbourne side that's missing their two best key defenders. But you can only do what you can do. And 
these two, what they did extremely well was got out of each other's road, mm. which they weren't capable of doing the previous week against Jetta West. Far too often they were flying together. So what we've highlighted here is it's either Makai to Kerno or vice versa, Kerno to Makai. And that's, I mean, that's the method. That's what Cameron and Hawkins have done so well. And the longer the game went on, the more exposed North Melbourne's defence became um, and there's the numbers we're going to compare the two key forwards mm. from either end now North Melbourne actually had more inside 50s two yeah. more inside 50s and that is the result now Larky was injured he yeah. had a knock to the hip and was going poorly Common's a, a young player who is struggling to find his feet I like some of what he does he's, he's aggressive and I, I think he'll be a player that probably needs to go back to the VFL didn't have a kick on the night and, and just a couple of goals for the year versus that yeah. a complete domination when you're looking at every line but that's the level that those two want to mm. get to and, and follow Kerno and Mackay. All right, well, Harry Mackay, as we mentioned, he's kicked four goals. He found himself in some MRO hot water as well for this striking charge on Harry Sheasel. I reckon they probably challenged this. It was deemed careless conduct, fair enough, high contact, fair enough. I'm not 100% sure that's medium impact. I think that's the grounds they'd probably be challenging. Low. That's low impact. Yeah. That, that's, a, that's a fine for being stupid and reckless, um, but... No real harm done there. That's mm. a fine. And we want to see him playing against Adelaide yeah. in this Thursday night game in Gather Round. And if one thing I'm confident of this week, it's that Carlton will successfully get that downgraded and he plays Thursday night, which is the right result. Ben Cunnington subbed off in the third quarter with just 10 disposals to his name. This is what Alistair Clarkson had to say after the game. He's a clearance beast and we need him to be getting clearances for our, for our side and he'd had... He'd had none to halfway through the third quarter, so he'd be disappointed in that. But we just needed to try something, try something different. And, and Gunners just didn't have a didn't have a great day. So um, you know, we we just can't um, keep blokes on the on the field if they're not playing their role to the capability. Then um, we need to make a change. So that's two big calls he's made now because Todd Goldstein was left out of round one. Obviously, he's come back into the side since. Now, Ben Cunnington, he's pretty, mm. been very vocal, pretty significant statements after the game. Yeah. So I'm not sure David Noble gets away with that, mm. but Alistair Clarkson can. And, and it's the right call, really. Like, yeah. when you look at Cunnington's numbers, no clearances. If he's not getting clearances, he's not really any use. He's about to turn 32. Mm. Clearly, their next premiership isn't going to be with Ben Cunnington in it. Minus 10 metres gain, so... They had Hugh Greenwood on the bench, who plays the exact same role, inject the fresh legs into the game. But, yeah, it'd be interesting to see. I mean, the game does move past you pretty quickly. Yeah. And Ben Cunnington is 32 and how quick and powerful the midfielders are now. He's probably got a challenge, like Trent Cochin and others yeah. that are at that level, Dyson Heppel, to reinvent himself. He's a good forward. He can go forward. Mm. So perhaps he, he looks to do that a bit more as well. OK, and we'll take a look at the remaining round four fixtures in just a sec. The AFL Live app is the home of footy. All the stats, highlights, live scores and more. All in one place, the Match Centre. Keep an eye on every game. Footy was back with a bang. They, they just had no answers on the weekend. Get your daily footy fix. Welcome to Gettable. This is your one-stop shop for trade, draft and free agency. The AFL Live app is where you can watch your favourite shows. Wherever and whenever you want. The AFL Live app is everything you need to connect with our game. When you're younger, you train for a sport. When you're older, you train for the rest of your life. Download the AFL Live app now and never miss a moment. Well, Kane, rain, round four continues on Easter Sunday with Essendon hosting GWS at Marvel Stadium. Melbourne travels to Optus Stadium to take on West Coast and then Geelong plays Hawthorne on Easter Monday. I want to get to the Canes question now, though. Is it season over for the Cats if they lose on Easter Monday? Oh, not willing to call it. Oh, Firstly, oh four? Nah, I'm not going to call it because I've written them off too often, but I was interested to see them drop Henry and Bruin. Yeah. So there has been a statement made and... Chris Scott was very patient in the first three weeks. Patience is running out. Mm. Well, Kane, I'll see you in Adelaide next week. It's gather round. We'll see you then.